What's up guys, welcome back to the channel with a how to set up the suspension on the RS660. Now we all love modifying our bikes. We like putting loud exhausts, we like to make the bike faster by tuning them, we want to make it look better by installing tail tighties and mirrors and windscreens, but the most important modification that you can do and probably the most cheap modification you can do slash setup to your bike is adjusting your suspension for your weight and your skill. A lot of times riders will not even dare touch their suspension because they feel intimidated by it or their excuse might be I don't have the tools to do it because most people think that you need a front stand, a rear stand, maybe a front wheel chalk and a lot of tools. In reality, you don't. You don't need a front stand, you don't need a rear stand, you don't need a front wheel chuck. If you don't have all that, you can still do it with the assistance of two extra people, meaning you would have to be on your bike, the other person has to take the measurements and the other person would have to keep the bike upright. So it is possible, you don't need everything, but I will show you what you do need when it comes to tools. You will need, obviously, tape measure, a flat screwdriver, preferably long. I'll explain to you why. You will need these cutters because we're going to be using a um, zip tie for the front uh, suspension. You will need an extension with a 14 millimeter socket and a ratchet to be able to uh, adjust the preload on the front forks. You will need a castle nut for the rear shock and also you will need another ratchet with a four millimeter hex to remove the side fairing on the other side to reach the rear shock. Now you will also need your manual to retrieve some information. You will need your manual to retrieve the front fork stroke or travel, uh, which I believe it's 120 millimeters. I will have to uh, check that on my manual, but one big advice. In your manual, you have uh, two suggestions for suspension setup. One is, I believe, street and one is a sport setup. It basically tells you how many turns to uh, adjust the uh, preload and the rebound for the front and rear shock, uh, shock. Do not do that. Whatever that number is, I do not suggest doing that. I did it on my RS660 and it felt miserable. It was a nightmare riding that bike. It basically removed all static sag in the rear. It was a disaster. So I'll go into details on how to adjust it. You can just throw the book in the side. You don't need it. Now, before I go ahead and start adjusting the suspension, I wanna go over the terminology of what we're going to be adjusting. One is the preload that we're going to be using a 14 millimeter. When I say adding preload, that means I will be turning the preload clockwise towards the right or removing preload by turning counterclockwise towards the left. Same thing applies for the rebound, which we're going to be using a flat head screwdriver. The R660 does not have uh, adjustment for compression. So none of that here, we're only gonna remain in preload and rebound. Now the other thing too that I wanna clarify is that we often hear people saying, making the suspension stiffer adding more preload to make the suspension stiffer. Now, yes, we do use that terminology, but in reality, we're not making the, the spring stiffer. There's nothing we can do to make the spring rate stiffer. Adding preload does not make the spring stiffer. It just alters the range of the travel of the spring by changing the amount of force needed to fully compress the spring. But in reality, we still just use the term, make it stiffer. So I just want to clarify that. So let's go ahead and jump with uh, setup. Okay, the first thing you need to do is to find your original position that the bike came from factory. Usually from factory, they add about either fully open to the left or maybe four or five turns of preload. So for that reason, to find my position, I'm just gonna start by going left all the way and counting turns from here. Basically having this straight, I'm gonna go one turn, two turns, three turns and that's it. Okay, so I'm gonna check the left, the right two. One, two, three. Okay, so now we know it was a three turns of preload. One, two, three. I'm putting it at the original position and I'm gonna keep counting to see how many turns I have of preload. Four, five, six, seven, eight, 
nine, ten, ten and a half almost on this one. And then for here, fully open. Fully open means all the way counterclockwise. Okay, so now I'm gonna start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, almost and a half. So ten and a half turns on both. Okay, so I'm gonna bring it back to the original position at three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a half. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a half. So we should be around three turns there. And now I'm gonna try to figure out the rebound. All right, now I'm gonna do the same thing with the rebound adjusters. I'm gonna start with the left one, counterclockwise. For this, you can actually hear there's an audible click. One, two, three, four, that's it. Same for this. One, two, three, four. Out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 23. So let's see if we have the same here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Yep, 23. So we have equal preload and equal rebound on both. Now I'm gonna bring it back to original by turning counterclockwise and going back to four. It was four clicks in. So if we turn it all the way out, It's one, two, three, four. Same thing for this. One, two, three, four. There you go. So now we know that we have four clicks in, which should mean 19 clicks out for rebound. And we are at three turns in for preload. All right, so now that we know our original position from factory, we keep them there so we can start adjusting them by having the rider go on the bike. But before we do that, what I need to do is find what the bottom out of the R60 is. So what is bottom out basically? Bottom out is when the fork fully compresses, but what people oftentimes confuse is that they believe the bottom out means that when this meets this, the actual casting, that's bottom out. That's not how you find bottom out. The proper way to find bottom out is you have to go in your manual and find the fork stroke or the full travel. In our case, it is 120 millimeters. So to find bottom out, what you need to do is to have the front fork fully extended. For instance, right now, my front fork is fully extended because I have it in a front stand under the triple clamp. So what I need to do is measure the distance from here to here, to the actual casting. Whatever this distance is, I will then have to remove, subtract 120 millimeters from it, and that will meet my bottom out. I'll show you how to do that. To take the proper measurement, I'm going to be measuring from the joint of the fork tube and the dust seal, which is right here. Not down on the dust seal here, but right over here, all the way down to the actual casting over there. So right now we are at 100, 143 millimeters, fully extended for the front fork, which means I'm going to take 143, subtract 120, and that is my bottom out. Okay, so 143 millimeters minus 120 millimeters, we're left with 23 millimeters. So we're gonna mark 23 millimeters on our measure tape here and it will be right there, which means this is our bottom out. What does that mean? That if the fork tube extends past this, that means you're bottomed out. That means you cannot compress the front fork anymore. Hence, 
you're kind of screwed because you're going to lose your front traction completely over tire and you're gonna crash. So we need to make sure that we stay away from this and how we're gonna mark this with a zip tie. I'm gonna take a zip tie, pass it through here, all the way down. Make it tight, but not too tight that it doesn't move and not too loose that it drops on its own. And then just cut down the rest of the cutters. There you go. So now when you brake, you will be able to monitor where your fork tube bottoms. And you need to be about, I would say, a minimum of 10 millimeters from the 23 millimeters, which is the bottom out. So 23 millimeters. If you like, you can also mark it there with a marker. I don't have a marker on me, so I'm not gonna mark it, mark it but that's where our bottom out is, right there. Basically, that's our bottom out. So you need to make sure that the zip tie never goes below 10 millimeters of your bottom out. Okay, one last thing regarding bottom out is that when you do make adjustments of your preload pre and rebound and you set up your bike for your weight and skill, you have to come back and readjust your bottom out because by adding or removing preload, you actually change the distance of the extended fork. So if we were 143 before, if I add or remove preload, this 143 might become 140 or it might become 145. So you have to come back, retake the measurements and find your different bottom out after that. Now, if you don't have a front stand to fully extend your fork, how do you do it? Well, you put the bike on your left side stand, you hold it from here, push it all the way up so you can extend the fork. I'm gonna put it around the same here and just push it all the way up until your front wheel lifts and take the measurement, 143. There we go. Now make sure that when you push the bike, you have full control of it, so that when the front wheel lifts, you don't drop your bike. Okay, now I have removed the front stand and I placed the bike on its own weight on the front wheel chalk. That way, the front suspension is compressed under its own weight, which means now we're going to measure to find the static sag. Static sag meaning the bike under its own weight. Let's find out. Okay, now we know that the fork fully extended is 143 millimeters. Now we're gonna measure at the same spots that we measured before. And it is at 115 millimeters. So basically what we need to do is subtract we have to subtract 143, that is the fully extended, minus 115, 28 millimeters. That means we have 28 millimeters of static sag. Now, I prefer the static sag for the front forks to be between 15 and 25 millimeters. So to do that, what we need to do is add preload. So we know right now that we are three turns in. So I'm going to add preload. I'm gonna add four turns. One, two, three, four. And another four here. One, two, three, four turns. That means we're seven turns total out of 10 and a half. So let's go and measure again. I'm gonna compress from the front a little bit just to bring the suspension back in its resting position. And I'm gonna measure again from the same spots. And we are at 118, 118 millimeters. So we were at 143 fully extended minus 118. We're at 25 millimeters of static sag. We're gonna leave that, that there as reference. Next step is to find rider sag by having the rider going on the bike. Okay, so before you go on the bike, you have to make sure that you weigh equally to what you weigh when you have full gear on. 
Now you can either wear your entire gear, but I don't really recommend that because working on your bike while wearing your entire gear, it's not gonna feel nice. So what I personally do is I wear my vest, my weighted vest, this is a weighted vest, which weighs equally to what my gear weighs. I put it on and I take my measurements. If you don't have a weighted vest, you can actually use a backpack with some weights in it. Okay, now for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna be the one taking the measurements and I'm gonna have a rider sit on the bike. And while the rider is sitting on the bike, I'm gonna take measurements over the front fork, compress it. See, we had a little bit of compression. Now at the same time, I want to have the fork compress and sit in its resting position. So I'm gonna be pulling the front there. Compress it a few times over there. And then I'm gonna take the measurement, same spots. And we are at almost 110, we're at 100, 108, 108 millimeters. Which means, which means we were at 143 millimeters fully extended, minus 108 compressed with the rider on the bike. We are at 35 millimeters. 35 millimeters rider sag. We're on point at 35 millimeters. Usually for the road, I would say anything between 28 to 35 millimeters for the front fork is acceptable. So we're good here. Now let's assume that you took measurements and your rider sag was 45 millimeters. Now that's two months rider sag. So what will you do in that case? You will come up here and add some turns clockwise of preload technically making it stiffer, but remember, you're not really making it stiffer, you're reducing the amount of travel by adding preload. So if we were a 45 millimeters uh, rider sag, I would add a couple turns, maybe go from seven to nine, take measurements again, and again, and again. Now, what happens if you go down to 10 and a half turns and your rider sag is 40 millimeters or 43 millimeters? You have no more turns. You cannot add any more preload. What does that mean? Well, unfortunately, that means you're too heavy for these springs and you need to change your springs. You need to put springs with a higher rate. Now the same thing applies for the opposite. What if our measurement was 22 millimeters of rider sag? Now what we would do, we come here and remove preload by going counterclockwise. Now again, what happens if we removed all preload, we were fully open towards the left, and then we had 23 millimeters of rider sag. What does that mean? That means that the spring or the spring rate of your bike is too stiff and you would want to change your springs to something softer. Now in our case, for our rider, we're perfect because we're at 35 millimeters of rider sag with seven turns of preload, which means we have still three and a half turns of preload if we want to make it stiffer and drop uh, rider sag maybe to 30 millimeters. Anything between 30 and 40 millimeters for the street is acceptable. Once you start dropping below 30, mil 30 millimeters, you're going to the realm of track riding. I could see up to 28 millimeters for the road. I don't like anything past 35 millimeters for the road. Now, remember, rider sag is not the only thing that you need to check. Once you take the bike for a ride, you've set up your suspension, you've set up your front suspension, then you take it for a ride and you see that the zip tie comes five millimeters away from your bottom out. That's too close to your bottom out, so maybe even though your rider sag is 35 millimeters, you're at seven turns of preload, but you're still very close to bottom out. What does that mean? You have to add preload. So you can come back, go from seven turns to eight, nine, or even 10, ride your bike again, lift your zip tie up, and see where your zip tie goes. If your zip tie now goes 10 millimeters away from your bottom out, remember our bottom out was 23 millimeters up from the axle casting, so 23 millimeters up and another 10 will bring to 33 millimeters. So if your zip tie is at 33 millimeters, that would mean it's acceptable, you're safe. Now, if you're at 10 turns of preload and you're still that close to your bottom out, that means you need new springs, you need stiffer springs. Okay, now remember when I told you that once you make adjustments to the preload, 
the fully extended fork distance will change. We were at 143 millimeters before, so now we, have, we went from three turns in preload to seven. So from now from 143 millimeters, we have to find out where we are. And we are at 146. So we increased the extended travel from 143 to 146. So we were 143 before, but we added four turns of preload, and there were seven turns of preload. So now we're 146 millimeters, fully extended. Now we're gonna subtract the 120, millim millim the 120 millimeters that the manual tells us. Now we're at 26 millimeters. So before we were at 23 millimeters bottom out, now we're 26. So what we're going to do is, again, we're gonna mark at 26 millimeters over there and that is our bottom out over there so you can take a marker mark the bottom out right there at 26 millimeters and always make sure that your zip tie remains at least 10 millimeters above your bottom out see your bottom out can change based on the preload that you will give on your fork okay so now that we've found our adjustments on preload and we also found where our bottom out is, we need to adjust rebound. How do we do that? Well, we have to make sure that when we fully compress the fork, it returns in its original position and stays there. What we don't want it to do is return higher and bounce back. We don't want this movement, not this. We want compress and back, compress and back, not this. We don't want this, so let's give it a try. All right, to check the forks, you're gonna grab it from the handlebars, hit the front brake, and then compress and let it go on its own. Do not put weight, do not stop the return on your own. Compress it and let it return on its own. So let's see where our four clicks in of rebound. So let's go at the fork and see how the fork behaves all the way down. Okay, so compressing, releasing. Okay, that's a huge fail, okay? I compress, release, and it jumps. One more time. All right, that's a fail. So we need to add rebound. Okay, we know that we are four clicks in, meaning turning right from fully open. Based on how the fork behaved, I would say we have to add at least 14 or 15 total turns. So that means I'm gonna add 10 more one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That means we're 14 clicks in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That means 14 clicks on both. I'm gonna retest. Let's check the fork one more time down. Okay, checking. Okay, better, but not enough, which means I'm gonna add two more clicks, which means we're gonna go out to 15, 16, 15, 16, and let's recheck. Compressing. Okay, that's a pass. Perfect, so 16 clicks in for rebound out of 23. So if we come here and we go 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, okay? So basically we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven clicks out of 23. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven clicks out. Seven clicks out on rebound, seven turns in for preload. Front suspension is set. All right, to adjust the rear suspension, unfortunately, Aprilia has made it difficult for us with the R660 because we have to remove the seat and the cowl to remove the side panel using a four millimeter hex to be able to get to the rebound adjuster. And okay, we're gonna need a four millimeter hex for this. The 
four millimeter hex for this. And just slide it out over here. There we go. Okay, once you remove the side panel, you can replace the seat on the bike because we're gonna have to use the seat for the rider to sit on and take measurements. But the reason we remove the panel is because we need access to this very, very <laughs> digged in adjustment rebound. There you go. I don't know if you can see it well, but the screw is in there. That's the rebound adjustment in there. And that's why we need to remove the side panel. Okay, before we adjust preload, I wanna check to see at what position is the rebound. So, we're gonna go counterclockwise, left. One, two, three, four, five. Five turns out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 10 turns. So we were five clicks out of 10. One, two, three, four, five. We'll keep it a five to see where we are. And we're gonna go ahead and also adjust the preload. Okay, so now being a five clicks out for rebound, I'm gonna take this opportunity to check the rebound of the rear sock by compressing it and releasing it. All right. Not bad for five clicks out. So basically here you need the same thing. You need to compress, return to the same position without having a bounce. And here we don't have a bounce. So we have a good starting point. Perfect, so now we can go ahead and take measurements to find static sag and rider sag. And based on the preload that we may need or may not need to put, we're gonna recheck the rebound. Okay, so now you need to find, just like you did at the forks, you need to find two fix points, um, one at the tail, which I'm going to be using the turn signal from the NRC tail tidy, which actually works out perfect for this, and the actual uh, over here. So I'm gonna take the measurement first to see where I am, at what distance. So I am at 54 centimeters, exactly 54 centimeters. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the bike lifted up and check the distance. So I was an increase of five millimeters. Now let it go down again. Perfect, lift it up again. There we go, six millimeters. Six millimeters of rider sag. That is actually perfect. Uh, six millimeters of rider sag is pretty good. So as you saw, if you have someone lift the rear tail and you take the difference of the two measurements, that will be your static sag. Anything between five and 10 millimeters static sag is acceptable. If you go below five millimeters, you're pushing it, your bike's gonna become too stiff. Now, the issue is that sometimes, based on the weight of the rider, you have to add enough preload to the point that you lose rider sag, I mean static sag, meaning that if I go ahead and add maybe two turns uh, of the castle nut of preload, I may eliminate static sag completely. I may drop to one or two millimeter static sag. That is not acceptable. So what happens then? What happens when you need more preload but you lose static sag? Well, you need a stiffer spring, you need a, uh, a higher spring rate. Just like same with the forks, same with the rear sock, you have to know your weight and what the spring rate of your spring, your stock spring is. All right, now to measure rider sag, you have to find the exact same two spots that you used to measure static sag. And then you're gonna have the rider go on the bike while you're holding these two positions. Okay. So we have a total of five, 10, 15, 20. So we have 20 millimeters of rider sag. Now that's not enough. 20 millimeters of rider sag is technically too stiff for this rider. rider. Hence, the reason we have only six millimeters of static sag. Okay, so since now we know that our rider sag is 20 millimeters, we need to increase this. How do we do that? Well, we have to add some turns of preload 
at the castle, not here. Now, a lot of people just count turns of this castle nut. I prefer to count threads. So here you'll see the threads. And at this moment we're at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven threads. So by making it looser, technically, by turning this castle nut counterclockwise, you will have less. So you can go from seven to six threads. That's how you can have keep reference of the position of the spring of the sock. So now we have to lose this, turn this counterclockwise, and make it make this softer. So to make this loose, I'm gonna start with a castle nut rinse, go counterclockwise, make it loose. So if you see while you're making this loose, this also turns with it. In our case, that's fine for now. It saves us the time of having to adjust both. Okay, so now we are one, two, three, four, five, six and a half threads. So we can go half turn. One, two, three, four, five, okay, six threads. So we, we loosen down to from seven to six threads. Now we're gonna remeasure rider sag and see where we are. Okay, now that we have removed preload, one thread worth of preload, we're gonna re-measure the standard position and then we're gonna have the rider go on the bike again and we're gonna check the difference. There you go, 5, 10, 15, 20. So we went up to 25, 25 millimeters rear sag. All right. Okay, now that we have removed preload and we added five millimeters of rider sag, we went from 20 millimeters to 25. I'm gonna recheck static sag just for reference. Okay, same spots, two spots here. And then we're gonna lift the rear. Okay, and now we are at seven. Let's lift it one more time. All right, seven millimeters right, uh, static sag. So we increased one millimeter of static sag and we increased five millimeters of rider sag by removing one thread of preload counterclockwise. All right, so now we are five clicks out for rebound and I'm gonna check rebound one more time. And we're pretty good at five clicks out. Now, just for reference, I'm gonna show you what it looks like by removing all rebound. All counterclockwise, fully open. Now, this is what it would look like. See how is it, it has a bouncy effect? You don't want that. That's why you add preload to slow down the oil, to slow down the bounce. Five clicks out. Perfect. All right guys, setup is complete. Now, one very important thing that you have to understand, this setup is for reference only and how you can use this video to, as a guide to set up your suspension. You cannot copy these numbers. You cannot copy the turns of the castle nut that I added. You cannot copy the turns of preload or, or the clicks of, of uh, rebound on the forks or the measurements because everything will be dependent on you based on your weight, but not only your weight, but also your skill as a rider. For instance, with gear, I weigh 200 pounds. And based on my skill, I need certain number of turns on preload and rebound because I'm braking really, really hard to the point I'm reaching um, the bottom out very, very close. So close that I'm actually due for springs. I need a stiffer spring rate. Now, if you're also 200 pounds with gear, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that you need new springs because your riding skill may not be at the point where you're actually braking so hard or you're taking turns fast enough to compress your suspension to the point that you need to have the same setup with me or necessarily having new springs. Also, another point that I wanna make is that once you set up your base setup based on your weight, your rear rider sag, your static sag, uh, your rear rebound, same for the front, that will be your base setup. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be on those numbers. Once you complete the base setup, you have to take the bike out for a ride. Now, if you're a street rider, you're gonna take it out on the street and ride it wherever you're riding it, maybe at the canyons, ride it as hard as you can based on how you ride. Now, if you're not a street rider and you ride on the track, then you will have to take the bike out for a ride at the track and test your bike. Why? Well, if you take it out of the track and you do a few laps, what happens is the oil gets warmer. So the warmer the oil gets, the thinner it becomes. So then rebound settings may need to be adjusted. So just because you set up certain numbers here on cold suspension doesn't necessarily mean that these will be the numbers at the track or maybe after an hour of you riding outside of the street and at the canyons. So guys, take this video as a reference to set up your base setup. And what I will also do is everything I went through in this video, I will type it and leave it as a comment underneath this video. So you have something in writing to go back to refer to as instructions with, in combination with this video. Hopefully this video with the instructions will make you feel more comfortable doing your own base setup because you will be amazed how much better the bike will feel while riding it. Guys, thanks for watching. If you have a question, leave a comment. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like button and make sure you hit that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next one.